Hi, uh, in this video I would like to explain in very simple terms the concept of shells and subshells and electronic configuration of an atom. The atomic theory started with Bohr postulating that electrons revolve around a nucleus much like planets revolve around the sun. So I'll take that as a starting point and then go to the valence theory. So here the nucleus is represented in the center, protons and neutrons are bunched together and you can see electrons revolving around it in a single plane. So in the valence shell theory, the orbits were kind of grouped together. So you don't see a single orbit, you see orbits which are very close to each other, the yellows and the cyan blues. So let's look at a close up here. So the nucleus is in the center, you have a single orbit with two blue electrons, but after that you get the two yellow orbits which are close to each other. You see three cyan blue colored orbits which are close to each other. So these groupings of orbits are called shells. So the orbit for the blue colored electrons of course is a single orbit and the grouping of both these yellow orbits is one shell. The grouping of the three orbits of cyan blue color is one shell. So this kind of gives an idea of why it was called a shell. So let's look at a still image now. So the innermost orbit which is very important and which has the blue electrons is called the K shell. Although it is only one orbit it's still called a shell. If you go to the next outer orbit the yellow ones you can see that it has two parts, an inner orbit of the yellow and the outer orbit of that yellow shell. So that shell is called the L shell and we'll come to what's the name of the inner part of it and the outer part of it. The next outer orbit, the one in cyan blue color, is a grouping again and it's called the M shell. The final outermost orbit in this particular image with the orange colored electrons is called the N shell. This is a rough representation. The real atom doesn't look like that. So now in the valence shell theory they called each particular orbit as a subshell. So inside the shell you have subshells. So the first innermost orbit is of course just one. So it's called 1 S subshell and the number 2 shows it can have a maximum of two electrons. The maximum allowable electrons in any subshell is mentioned on the top left corner of this image. Now coming to the next shell, K, then we had L, the yellow one that has got two orbits. The inner orbit is called S shell. So you have the second shell, 2 for 2, S for S subshell and again the small 2 shows it can have a maximum of two electrons. The outer part of the yellow shell is called a P shell. So it's a second shell, P subshell, and it can have a maximum of six electrons. Similarly, if you go to higher orbits, you can see uh, D as well, and the D subshell can hold up to 10 electrons. This is how you draw the atomic structure. Now, if we take different elements in the periodic table, depending upon how many electrons they have, one can write the electronic configuration. So uh, for hydrogen it has only one electron. So that makes it very simple. It will rotate in the innermost orbit. So the innermost orbit is one and it, there is only one subshell called S and in that S we put in one electron. So that's the electron configuration. So I call it the K shell. Similarly, you can write the electron configuration for let's say carbon. It's got six electrons. So the first job to find out is how many electrons it's got. Then the atom will fill in the innermost orbit, so that will become S2. Then the next higher orbit, that's 2S2. The next higher orbit is 2P. And in that 2P orbit, we can't have 6 because we have only 2 left, so we just put in plug in 2. So 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6. So all the 6 electrons have occupied their places. It's not a musical chairs. Uh, the innermost electron will have to get filled in first, followed by the next orbit and the next orbit and so on. Now if you come to chlorine, you can see that it's gone on to the third orbit, which is the cyan blue. So you have 3s2 and 3p5. 
in 3p5 we could have gone up to 6 but there are only 17 electrons so we can only fill 5 electrons in the p subshell copper is an exception we won't cover that now so the main question here is what is valence shell and how many valence electrons are there in an element and that determines whether the element is inert element or it will react a lot with other chemicals and so on so if you take argon as an example it has got 18 electrons because that's the first question we ask how many electrons it's got and if we fill the electron configuration we get 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2 and 3p6 we can see here that the last one the 3p6 is also full the p can't hold more than 6 so it is fully satisfied and an element like argon which is fully satisfied doesn't need to take any electron from somebody else so it becomes an inert gas similarly you can do it for carbon and for carbon the outermost shell which is 2s2 2p2 is called the valence shell or the outer shell I prefer the word outer shell and how many electrons are there in the valence shell you add 2 plus 2 so that makes it 4 so that's how the number of valence electrons are counted I hope uh, this video was uh, kind of useful for you Thank you and have a great day.